أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم هل أتاك حديث موسى إذ ناداه ربه بالوادي المقدس توا اذهب إلى فرعون إنه طغى فقل هل لك إلى أن تزكى وأهديك إلى ربك فتخشى فأراه الآية الكبرى فكذب وعصى ثم أدبر يسعى فحشر فنادى فقال أنا ربكم الأعلى فأخذه الله نكال الآخرة والأولى إن في ذلك لعبرة لمن يخشى رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه يجمعين ثم أما بعد once again everyone السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته uh, the intention today is to try to finish our um, observations on سورة النازعات I'm going to go back a little bit and uh, cover some things I didn't cover yesterday from ayah number 17 onwards and hopefully we reach the conclusion today Allah Azza wa Jal describes there, we were talking that the, this is the narrative section of the surah where Allah recalls the account of Musa alayhi salam in brief words. اِذْهَبْ إِلَىٰ فِرْعَوْنَ إِنَّهُ تَغَى Go to the Pharaoh, certainly he's the one in fact that has rebelled. إِنَّهُ تَغَى A couple of language uh, issues here that I'd like to bring to your attention. The first of them is the meaning of the word tughiyan that I didn't dive into as deeply yesterday. The word tagha, which is translated rebelled, uh, it occurs in the meaning, it gives the meanings of being oppressive uh, and, it, uh, and going too far in being oppressive, like outrageously oppressive. Like you know how you get reports sometimes nowadays of people committing acts of torture or crimes against humanity and that kind of thing? That would actually come under the word tughiyan in the modern sense or tagha. Al utu wa zulm. Utu also means animosity. And again, to, to do something that is an act of aggression. To be, you know, there's one thing that somebody takes a military action or takes violence and takes matters in their own hand because they're defending themselves or they're reacting to something that occurred. It's another that when they, when they aggress without any preemptive reason or they're preemptive in their strike, that's utu also. And then on top of that, wa zulm and oppression within. So he's, a, 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 an oppressive, dangerous entity, innahu tagha. The other thing that's important in the words innahu tagha is uh, there's two, two ways of looking at it. The word inna in the Arabic language can serve sabab, grammati- gram- you know, grammatical analysis says. What that means is, go to the Pharaoh because he has rebelled. And so the reason Musa alayhi salam should go to the Pharaoh is because he's rebelled. That's powerful because what that means is that the, the, the work of Islam and the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have to go to the criminals. Like we have to go speak with them and engage with them. We can't just be talking about them. They have to be challenged, they have to be addressed, and they have to be given the message of Islam. We can't just sit in a corner, complain about what they do and their, you know, the crimes they commit, etc. They must be engaged directly. That would come because Allah is saying you have to go to him because he's a criminal, because he's rebelled. The other implication of innahu tagha, interestingly, is what they call al-ithbatu ala ghayr al-fa'il. What that means is, in fact, he is the one that's rebelled, not the other way around. In other words, he, when he does his criminal acts, when he punishes people, tortures people, kills people, etc., he makes it sound like they're the ones that are criminals. They're the ones that are rebelling against the government. They're the ones that have committed a crime. And Allah is saying, actually, it doesn't matter what he says, he's the one that's the criminal. And that's actually teaching us something very powerful about oppressive regimes. Oppressive regimes don't just commit acts of violence. They actually redefine what they do as peace and what everybody else does as aggression and crimes. So you can have governments in the world, even today, of course, especially today, that are killing civilians. And when they're killing civilians, they're saying, no, 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 we are fighting the terrorists, or we're, we're fighting the outlaws, or we're fighting the anarchists, or we're fighting the, cor- the corrupt elements within our society, or the criminals, 
or these are just a bunch of gangs, violent gangs, and we're getting rid of the criminals in society. And they'll come in their, you know, dressed up clothes and nice press releases and say, we are restoring peace and order while at the same time they're bombing hospitals or they're, they're burning down homes. You know, or shooting at children and th these kinds of things. So Allah by saying, Innahu taha is saying, doesn't matter what the propaganda is. He's the one that's the criminal. See through it. Because you know, it is in fact true that the greatest threat to the peace and harmony of Egypt was Fir'aun. I mean, the greatest threat to the people was Fir'aun. And yet, when Musa alayhi salam delivered his message, you know what he told people? He said, Yuridani an yukhrijakum bi ardikum bi sihrihima. That these Musa and Harun, their intention is to get you kicked out of your land. They're a danger to your country. <laughs> Fir'aun was saying, Musa is a danger. Musa is dangerous. He's the, he's the threat to your homeland security. You know? That he, he, he flipped the script. And so, Innahu Tagha actually teaches us. That it doesn't matter what the script officially is, it doesn't matter what the press release is, you have to look at reality, and Allah determines that He is in fact guilty of these crimes, and therefore He should be spoken to. And then, فَقُلْ هَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ أَن تَزَكَىٰ I alluded to this yesterday, that هَلْ لَكَ is soft language. But I also wanted to share some commentary here with you. وَالْإِسْتِفْهَامُ هُنَا لِلْعَرْضِ مَعَ تَلَطُّفٍ وَصَرَّحَهُ فِي قَوْلِهِ فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنَا You know, this Question, would you consider even the possibility of bettering yourself, of coming towards a life that's more purified? When Musa is supposed to speak to him in such soft language, the commentary here is, the question is here to suggest softness and courtesy. And actually it's spelled out more openly in another part of the Qur'an. In Surah Taha, Allah Azza wa says, both of you, meaning Moses and Aaron, Musa and Harun, go to him and both of you should speak to him qawlan layyinan. Speak to him with soft, sweet speech. Layyin is actually in Arabic the, de the description of a really good date, not the haram kind between men and women, the date from a palm tree. That date, the sweet date. <laughs> you know, that's actually called layyin, meaning speak to him softly. Speak to him in flexible language. Because you know a date is soft and flexible and it's sweet. That's actually the description of the way you should speak to Fir'aun. This is actually also, this is also teaching us tactics. It's not just adab. It's not just manners that doesn't matter how obnoxious they are, you speak to them nicely, but this is actually strategic. When you are going to speak to people in political power, and you have a lot of anger built up inside you because you know you, you represent people who have been oppressed, and there are crimes that he's committed that he hasn't been charged with, and he hasn't taken, you know, the law, he's taken the law and order in his hands, etc. You've got all this built up, and now you finally get a chance to sit in this gathering and you get to meet this person who's responsible for all these crimes. You don't just have your own anger, you have the anger of all of your people built up inside you and you're the only one who gets to speak to him and that's the moment where you might throw a shoe at him. And that's the moment that you might just scream and yell, isn't it? And guess what happens to the person who starts screaming and yelling? What happens next? Within seconds. They're removed from that audience, aren't they? they so. They got, to, what did that shoe throwing accomplish? Other than, a, you know, a funny scene on, for comedians. But other than that, what did it accomplish? You got to blow your hot air, but you got, you accomplished nothing. You should have come across as calm and cool. You have an agenda. You're not there to suck up to anybody. You're not there to, you know, kiss his feet or nothing. But the manner in which you speak has to be soft, collected, calm, so that you don't come across as a you know, erratic, angry maniac, and they say, well, this person's not behaving, remove him from here. As a matter of fact, when you remain calm and you speak, over time, pretty, pretty soon, because you're remaining and keeping your composure, the oppressor will lose his cool. And they'll start looking like a fool. Because you kept your cool. And that's a very important lesson to learn, because Musa salam, when he's going to go to Fir'aun, He's got a lot of aggression built up inside of him. He's seen a lot of the oppression firsthand. And as a matter of fact, the, you know, his own mother, his own family. And on top of that, Asiya, who, who's begging, who's begging Allah for protection from, from Fir'aun. He's seen that in the household. He's oppressive inside the home and for the entire land. And for someone like Musa alayhi salam who gets angry easily, this is also important. Musa alayhi salam has a pretty serious temper. And he could throw a punch. We've seen that before. 
And he, could, he just takes matters in his hands. And he, he, he's afraid of his temper. As a matter of fact, when he spoke to Allah, he said, وَيَضِيقُ صَدْرِ وَلَا يَنْطَلِقُ لِسَانِ My chest becomes tight. Because if he says obnoxious things like, I am God, how dare you speak to me this way? It's going to make me upset. My chest is going to become tight. And when it does, my, my tongue stops moving, which is another way of saying my tongues don't do the talking at that point, my hands do. That's also part of the meaning. So, Ya Allah, I get really upset. So you need to send me, give me someone who will make sure I remain calm and contain. فَأَرْسِلْ إِلَىٰ هَارُونَ Give me Harun. Send Harun along too. Right? So that's, that's part of the strategy of Musa Alayhi What we're trying to understand here then is people who represent the cause of Islam in the media. People are going to, who are going to get a chance to speak with power. They have to be people who can control themselves. They have to be people that can remain calm. And they can remain on point. And they can't be swayed by emotion. Because those people are master manipulators. Fir'aun is a master manipulator. He will get you upset. He will get you riled up. You know? He will, he will make comments that will make you go, how dare you speak that? After all the crimes you've committed. And he's trying to get under your skin. So you lose it. And then you look like the lunatic. You look like the, you know, the absurd one. And so innahu taha has a lot of, you know, and, and on top of that, فَقُلْ هَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ أَن تَزَكَّى has a lot of strategy inside of it. So in any case, فَقُلْ هَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ أَن تَزَكَّى نَوْ وَأَهْدِيَكَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَتَخْشَى And so I'm, I'm, that I may guide you, to you towards your master so you may be afraid. But before we get to that, the, the idea of tazakka, to become pure, وَالزَّكَاةُ أَنْنُمُوا عَنْ خَيْرٍ وَبَرَكَةٍ وَتَزْكِيَةُ النَّفْسِ أَن تَتَطَهَّ so the idea of zakat in Arabic is that something grows or betters because of goodness. In other words, we're learning something about the notion of becoming a better person. Becoming a better person means that you and I are trying to get away from things that are filthy. And as we do, it enhances us. And as it enhances us, Allah it adds barakah in your life and goodness in your life. What that means is Allah opens more doors for you to do more good and more strength for you to get away from the bad stuff in your life. And that cycle keeps on strengthening you to get further and further away. Nobody turns into an angel overnight. Nobody becomes perfect overnight. Nobody starts praying five times a day in the masjid, etc., etc., overnight. Then that doesn't happen. You take steps. You go one step after another, one stage after another, right? So the idea of ila and tazakka is you're, okay, fine, you're not gonna be, you're not gonna be a salih tomorrow. But at least you're on the road, at least that, and that's what's expected of you. I was really interested in, um, and I thought I knew this word, but I, I really didn't. Uh, the word huda, one of the most common words in the Quran, guidance, right? And it's it's you know orig, its origin. Aslu istimalihi fil huda adnatia fil ma'i yu'minu biha al-athar. The origin of the word huda is actually, which we call guidance, is actually a rock protruding from the water. Like, uh, you know, you're out at sea, or you're close to, you're, you're not sure where you are, and there's a boulder or a pretty tiny island, like a rock sticking out of the water, and that becomes a landmark or a sea mark, if you will. Right, so now, th those who are discovering, or they were told, go this way, and you might discover a rock, and that's when you know you're close to the island, or whatever. So they look at that, and they know that they're on the right track. And from it comes the word huda. That's the original meaning of it. And Huda is our original Arabic, uses the word Huda also for bright, the bright daytime, in which the road is absolutely clear. Because, you know, at nighttime, the desert is impossible to navigate. And that the opposite is going to come later on with the word Ghatash. You know, Aghtasha Laylaha. Ghatash in Arabic, at nighttime, it's covered, you can't really tell where to go. La yuhtada bihi. You can't possibly find your directions in the time of Ghatash. But anyway, وَأَهْدِيَكَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ Suggesting that I will guide you towards your master. In other words, I will tell you what landmarks you're supposed to, what milestones you're supposed to reach. And so on that note, I wanted to, you know, based on the kinds of questions people ask me, not just stuff I read in books, but the kinds of discussions I have with people, I wanted to share some things with you. Maybe you've had the question yourself. How do I know if I'm guided? How do I know if Allah is happy with me? I mean, I'm trying to do this, 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 and this, but I'm not sure if this is good enough or, you know, whether Allah will accept it or not. And people have these kinds of 
notions, right? And then people ask, how do I know if my intentions are pure? And how do I know if my heart is clean? And I'm trying to do this dhikr and that dua, and which dua can I make that I can become X, Y, Z? And so there's all this like mystery as to where do I stand with Allah? So the, the first thing I'd like to share with you about that is that, you know, the rock sticking out of the water is a pretty prominent milestone. It's not a mysterious thing. It's a pretty obvious milestone, right? Guidance is not some crazy mystical thing until you see a parrot in your dream. You don't know if you're guided or not. And there's nothing crazy about guidance. Guidance is straightforward and simple. It's straightforward and simple. The first milestone in guidance is you are away from major evils. First milestone. You're doing good. Like, you know, sometimes moms bring their sons to me. It's, it's my favorite thing to, you know, see moms humiliate their, their teenage sons by bringing them to Nawal Ali Khan and saying, Dr. Mahabha, he's good, he prays, but he wakes a little, he, I have to wake him up for Fajr. I was like, auntie, you have to wake him up for Fajr? Really? Yeah, he doesn't wake up on his own. Hmm, that's horrible. This kid is just going straight to hell. No, he's not. There <laughs> are kids. There are kids who you could wake them up for Fajr and they'll hit you back. Your kid actually gets up and prays. One mother complained to me that he goes to the masjid but he's never there before the adhan. What planet are you living on? What planet are you living on? Compare this to the vast majority of kids his age. What he's doing, you should give him an award every morning. Make him his favorite breakfast every morning. For God's sake, he's going to the masjid. That's huge. She came to me to complain about him. I patted him on the back. I said, good job, man. Keep it up. That's awesome. You, I, told, I told off his mom, you should be proud. <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> you know, he's like, <laughs> you know. We have these superficially high standards of what it means to be guided for a young man to, to do that, to fight his sleep and you know, pray, to not to stay out of bad company. One came to me and said, he's 18 years old, he doesn't hang out with girls, he doesn't do drugs, he doesn't drink, he prays five times a day. It's just that sometimes he plays video games. And I said, auntie, let him play more video games because the stuff he's not doing is amazing. The stuff he would have been doing otherwise or he really loves basketball, or he really, he spends a lot of time playing with his friends. I was like, does he, when he goes on the weekend to play with his friends, does he pray? Yeah, so let him play. What's wrong with that? That's not, yeah, some kid's really happy right now. <laughs> then, then people come to me with, especially with kids, right? They'll, I, uh, I really want your advice on parenting. Uh, okay, sure, yeah. How old is your child? Six months. Let him be a baby. I really need your advice on how to teach my child Quran. He's two years old. Chill out. He's two years old. Let him be a baby. You don't need to turn him into a hafiz of Quran at three years old. You don't, chill out. Relax. Why do you have to force these standards on them? Who created these standards anyway? And now what's unfortunately happened in terms of guidance is we... The, um, the majority of the ummah have the completely false standards of guidance. Completely false. If my child has memorized the Qur'an, he's guided or she's guided. If my child knows how to recite the Qur'an or finish reciting the Qur'an, they're guided. What? There are plenty of kids that have memorized the entire Qur'an and they are now in gangs. I know plenty of them in different cities in this country that I can name that are in jail, that are hufad of Qur'an. They're, they're in jail that dealt drugs. Why am I saying that to you? Because our deen did not say, once you memorize Allah's book, you'll be guided. Or once you recite beautifully, you'll be guided. Or once you dress a certain way, you'll be guided. It didn't say these things. Once you come to Sunday school, you'll be guided. Or when you go to Islamic school, you'll be guided. Guidance is actually some very fundamental milestones. The way you think, the way you prioritize life, you're the way you treat people. Our guidance fundamentally is first and foremost attitude and some fundamental behavior. That's it. That's guidance. Knowledge, worship, all of those things, they enhance guidance. They further guidance. They support guidance. 
But we have removed from the equation our attitudes, our thought process, our behavior, our mannerisms. They don't have to do with guidance. It's just recitation and worship and appearance. That's guidance. That's all artificial. That's not guidance at all. So this is, that, that road needs to be reestablished. And that road is not just in reciting the Qur'an, it's actually in restoring the thought process that the Qur'an inspired. It wanted people to think a certain way. You know, to, to live their lives a certain way. Any case, so وَأَهْدِيَكَ إِلَى رَبِّكَ The road to guidance is a very simple one. On the, on the side note, this might, some of you might think this is very controversial. I have to share with you what I'm convinced of, uh, not anything else. You are completely free to disagree. Uh, we we're all students here, so am I, and I may be entirely wrong. But let me just tell you, our, when you study the Qur'an, beginning to end, and you study the life of our Messenger وسلم, beginning to end and the advice that he used to give people when they would come to him and say I want to be a better person, I want to go to Jannah, what should I do? The advice that he would give would be very simple It's never complicated It's never complicated, it's always simple And it's not like here are the 80 things you do to purify your heart or here are the 70, here's the manual of checking whether or not your heart is cleaner no, It was nothing like that, it was just straightforward uh, how about afshu salam wa at'imu ta'am? How about you just say salam to people and feed people? Be more hospitable. Cool. That's what I gotta do? Yeah, yeah, just, just do that. Qul la ilaha illallah thumma staqim. Just say la ilaha illallah and be firm. Another one comes and he says, la taqdab. Don't be angry. Just don't, you have a temper issue, don't be so mad. Work on your temper. That's it. Done. What about qiyamul layl? What about fasting on Mondays and Thursdays? What about that? He didn't give the whole list. We make the whole list. Based on multiple hadith, on multiple occasions But do you ever wonder why the Prophet ﷺ didn't One person came and sat him down and gave him the entire list All in one shot He didn't Why not? Because the deen is simple It doesn't ask much of you It doesn't put a lot of burdens on you But now we, because we, we want to mystify the subject We want to have a manual of purification Which is exhaustive And here are the 400 things that you must purify your tongue from And here are the 500 things to cleanse your heart And here's what you do with your eyes And here's what you do with your limbs And you're just like, Islam is Oof, that's intense And when you read more and more of that stuff You realize, I'll never be that and then on top of that, we, we hear stories in our sermons, in our khutub all the time about people who prayed tahajjud every single night and they, they, fasted, they, they, they fasted every day they could. And on top of that, they, were, they made so much dua to Allah that food, you know, lions wouldn't eat them even if the lion was hungry and it would bring them food or something. Or, you know, and you hear these crazy stories and then all you get in your head is, man, those people were amazing. I'm horrible. They had guidance way back when, I can't have it. That's just way out of my league, you know? That's the stories we hear. Like for example, even when it comes to giving in the path of Allah, what story you hear all the time? Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhuma gave half, Abu Bakr gave everything. You've heard the story many, many times? Are those the only two sahaba? There are thousands of companions. Some gave a date. Some gave very little. They also saw Umar. They also saw Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhumah. They saw them, but they couldn't give like that. They're not in that situation and they're not at that level. What we do is we take the most extreme high examples and we make it sound like that's the standard for everybody. That wasn't even the standard for the people around at the time. They were even an extreme awesome case for the people around them. What to speak of us? You know, it's not fair to do that. And Allah spoke about all of the companions and said, Allah anhum wa radu anhum. We don't talk about the other stories. We don't talk about the wild stories. We don't talk about the stories where a sahabi comes to the Prophet and says, Ya Rasulullah, I did something bad. What'd you do? I was a girl, I was walking by, she looked really pretty, I went over and kissed her. It happened in Medina. Radiallahu anhum. And he's like, pray to Raka'ah. Done. Move on with your life. Just apologize and just don't, don't make a big deal out of it. You know, I'm not saying you could do that, guys. Just chill out. But I'm saying, <laughs> but I'm saying they were human. They, they were human. They were, they weren't walking above water. It's not like that. You know. So the, the the notion of guidance is not some mystical crazy thing. It's a simple religion. It's asking you to do simple changes, make simple changes in your life, not big ones. What is wrong, all of you know. What is right, all of you know. 
All the prophets from history until now that the Qur'an records and talks about what, what evils they pointed out are the evils. They're the ones you get away from. Then there's of course icing on the cake, walk into, your, into the masjid with the right foot, make this dua before you go into the bathroom, make this dua when you eat, etc. Those athkar and those enhancements, those are basically bettering your religion, they're improving it, but that's actually icing on the cake. The cake itself, you can't forget. That's the fundamentals, and they're not many. They're not many. This is why the Prophet ﷺ made sure when you teach people religion, yassira wa la tu'assira. Make things easy, don't make things hard. Make things simple, make things easy, don't make them hard. So this is within wa ahdiyaka ila rabbika fatakhsha. So even you may be afraid. The other interesting thing here, the progression here that I'd like to highlight is, um, to, what's, the, what's the first step? When somebody's in the depth of darkness, somebody's bad like Fir'aun. The first thing is, if they stop caring about their own self, if they have no concern for themselves left, they have no fear of consequence even for themselves, there's no hope. If you actually deeply care just about your own well-being, because the first invitation was, Hallaka ila an tazakka, could I invite you to a pathway that might purify you for yourself? That's for your own good. Unless you're concerned about your own well-being, the road to guidance will never even, the journey won't even begin. Once you get on that road, you'll want to learn what is it that will purify me, wa ahdiyaka ila rabbik. I will guide you to your master. And as you get on that road and you see that you're walking away from darkness and towards light, you'll develop a fear. Fatakhsha. That's the third piece here. You'll develop a fear. What, fear of what? Not just a fear of Allah, but the fear now that you're taking steps forward, I'm afraid of doing things that will make me start taking steps backwards. You'll actually be afraid to not regress into what you used to be. You know, you want to move forward, not move backward. That consciousness will develop. That consciousness that wasn't, didn't used to be there before. فَأَرَاهُ الْآيَةَ الْكُبْرَى فَكَذَّبَ وَعَصَى ثُمَّ أَدْبَرَ يَسْعَى فَحَشَرَ فَنَادَى So let's look at these ayat together. The, so he showed him the greatest of miracles. The greatest miracle. الْآيَةَ الْكُبْرَى And so Mufassirun debated, was it the hand or the staff? And they, deb they debated it because, you know, the hand came second, so it's like the climax. Or was it that the staff is actually, the hand is changing the nature of something that already exists, right? It's changing the hand to something that it changes color. But the staff is going from a non-living thing to a, a living thing, and it's completely different in creation. Allah transformed it all together. So which of these should be considered the greater ones? Others argued, no, this is actually combined in the words al ayat al-Kubra. Allah showed him the greatest possible miracle, فَأَرَاهُ الْآيَةَ الْكُبْرَى is to say that he, he was shown the ultimate sign as in Allah doesn't have to use the plural to suggest all of the signs together is the greatest sign. What greater sign can there be? So the use of the singular doesn't just necessarily mean that it was just one sign that Allah is referring to. Okay? But anyway, after even seeing the strongest of evidences, فَكَذَّبَ وَعَصَى Then he called all of it a lie. He denied. He called it a lie. Now what? كَذَّبَ should come with a maf'ul. Kadhabahu, kadhabaha. He called the messenger a lie. He called a liar. He called the signs a lie or trickery or magic. He did all of those things, right? So it's left open ended. Anything that came to him, anything he could deny, he denied. So whether it's the character assassination against Musa salam, or dismissing the greatest signs as just magic or trickery, right? Or the signs that were happening all around him. You know, none of them he was willing to acknowledge. He considered all of them, no, this can't be happening. I mean, you would imagine that when you see water parting, and a people have gone through it, and you're standing there going, that's pretty big. I don't know if I want to be in between those two bodies of water. كَالطَّوْدِ Azim, Quran says, like tall standing mountains, each side. Why would you want to go through that? <laughs> that's... Irrational to think at this point, I want to risk my life doing that. But what are we learning there? Pride, stubbornness, arrogance can blind your intellect. Not even from realities of the unseen, you become so blinded by it, even something physically dangerous in front of you, you don't care anymore. فَكَذَّبَ وَعَصَى And he, dis then he disobeyed. ثُمَّ أَدْبَرَ يَسْعَى أَدْبَرَ يَسْعَى has some creative tafsir, which 
it doesn't make sense, but I still want to share with you because it's it's found in our tradition. Some said, so he called it he called it all a lie and he disobeyed. And then when the staff, when he was Musa Alisam was in the in the castle, in the court of the Pharaoh, and he threw the staff and it turned into a python, a large snake. Um, then he Thumma Adbara, then he turned his back and ran away. Thumma Adbara Yasa literally means that he turned his back and ran. So some interpret that as when this happened in the court, the Pharaoh turned his back and ran off. Because I, I want you to appreciate what happened in the courtroom. The, the staff, the asa, when it turns into a snake, there are multiple words used for it. Hayya, thu'ban. Hayya and thu'ban. Thu'ban is a python. Thu'ban is something that can swallow a small goat. Like it's massive, those, those thick python things. A hayya is one of those skinnier snakes that have very scary fangs. Now the larger ones, they don't need to, they don't need to poison their prey, they crush their prey and swallow them. And the small ones, they can't crush their prey, so what do they do? Paralyze them by their fangs, right? This snake is called both Thu'ban and Hayya. So this thing is a python with fangs. That's what this is. Not that you've seen Harry Potter or anything, but this is pretty intense. A large snake with fangs, and this is indoors. This is indoors. And on top of it being indoors, tas'a, it's not just sitting there, like it's just sitting there. It's running around indoors. Now, ladies, if there was a cockroach just went through here, like that, what would happen in this side? This would be like, if you want to see, you know, ka'annahum humurum mustanfira farrat bin qaswara, right? If you see like mules running from a lion, like Allah describes on Judgment Day, the terror. I've seen it, because I've seen it happen. I was in a... I was in a masjid in Brooklyn once, and the lady's side had a mouse. Oh my God, the most entertaining day of my da'wah life was... Because <laughs> I was describing Judgment Day, and then people were running like Judgment is here. Like there was... <laughs> it was... It was awesome. But imagine a giant snake. What should the reaction be? Everybody should be running off, right? Terrified. But actually, that's not a very plausible explanation because Surah Al-Shu'ara describes, even after the snake was out and all of this was happening, the dialogue continued. Pharaoh actually said, this is magic. And though others were phased, and even he may have jumped up on his chair, the conversation continued. He didn't run off and leave the conversation. It continued, and it's not like Musa followed him with his pet snake into the bedroom and said, hey, you want to finish talking? That didn't happen, <laughs> you know? It, it all remained there. So what does thumma adbara yas'a mean? And by the way, thumma littarakhi, right? As opposed to fa, thumma means something that happens a long time after. So the better way of looking at this text is actually much after he denied Musa alayhi salam and the great sign when, the, when it was presented to him, thereafter he turned away, he turned his back, in other words, he didn't want to hear anything Musa had to say again, because he's been defeated already, and all he's doing is yasa, running around, making efforts, the yasa is figurative for making efforts, to try to undermine his message. Now he's busy scheming. And adbara gives you the interesting meaning, not just of turning your back, but it's an alternative form of the word tadbir, like dabbara also, planning and scheming. Turning away, planning and scheming. He's trying to make some kind of a plot, some kind of a, uh, you know, a, a strategy by which he can completely annihilate the message of Musa alayhi salam. Though I could talk about Musa alayhi salam forever and ever because he's my favorite messenger in the Quran, I will share one piece with you that ties to the surah here. His agenda, his, the only way he could control the mess that was created. You see, when Musa alayhi salam humiliated him inside of the court, because he humiliated him. And that's described in Surah Al-Shu'ara. Uh, Fir'aun was owned and humiliated inside his own courtroom while sitting on his throne. The place where he's supposed to be honored is the place he was humiliated. And he needs to now contain that situation. Right? And the one option was I should just throw him in jail right away. Like Musa is dangerous. I can't let him out in public. It's going to be a nuisance. More people will, will hear about what happened. I should just throw him in jail. Which is why he said, La in ilahan ghayri la aj'alannaka min al-masjunin. If you take another god, I'm going to make you among those other people that have been thrown into prison already. 
I'll, you'll join the other inmates. But there's a problem. The inmates in prison are already people who are rebels against who? The Pharaoh. So if he throws them in prison, there's going to be a secret army developing inside the prison of those who are convinced by Musa. Because he's not going to not preach inside prison. He's going to be giving da'wah inside. And so, and by the way, if he throws him into prison, what is the staff, you know, the cleaners, the security guards, everybody around in the court is going to say, you know, Pharaoh was so scared, he couldn't even answer him. And he's so scared of him, he threw him in jail. And now generals and other commanders might even start going to visit Musa in prison. And just having a chat with him. Because they're all impressed at this point. Let him go. Arjih. Arjih wa akhahu. Let him go and his brother go. Wabaafil madaini hashirin. Gather as many sorcerers as you can from different cities, from different schools of thought of magic. Put a dream team together of all of these sorcerers and then we'll crush him in public. This is his scheme. Fahashara. When the ayah says fahashara, then he gathered, herded. Hashar in Arabic. Bimalahu dalalatun sariha ala jam'il muzdahim. يُغْنِي عَنْ ذِكْرِ الْمَحْذُوفِ حشر. He gathered, but it doesn't say who did he gather. Because he gathered magicians, he forcefully gathered people. That's mentioned in Shu'ara also. وَقِيلَ لِلنَّاسِ هَلْ أَنْتُمْ مُجْتَمِعُونَ People were told, are you gathering together or what? People didn't want to come out for the day of celebration. He wanted to make sure it's a massive, massive spectacle. And so he gathered all the people. فَحَشَرَ And then he made a call. He reminded them, أَنَا رَبُّكُمُ الْأَعْلَى I am your most supreme master. You know, the, the, the word hashar is used, you know, uh, uh, they say in Arabic, I'll mention this to you. إِلَّا فِي مَوْضِعِ الْحَشَدْ وَالشِدَّةِ وَمِنْ حَشْرِ الْجَمَاعَةِ أَيْ إِخْرَاجِهَا إِلَى الْحَرْبِ Hashar is used when you gather people for war also. When you gather people for war. Interestingly, hashar is also used when you herd animals. Which is an interesting allusion to the fact that he considered people animals. Like they were just herds of sheep to him. Like he didn't respect his citizenship. And so he just herded them, right? This is why criminals on the day of resurrection are going to be treated like animals, right? So it's Yawm al-Hashr also, it's the day of herding. You get herded. It's Yawm al-Jama', the day of gathering, but another more violent word for gathering is Hashr, which is actually herding. <laughs> and that's how it's used. You know, Qur'an will describe about him and the way he treated his people, istakhaffa qawmahu, istafazza, you know? To istifzaz and istighfaf means to make light of people, to think nothing of people, to consider people worthless. And that's how he thought of people. Insects. That's why he killed the way that he, that he did. It's actually giving you, the, 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 the commentary about Fir'aun in the Qur'an gives you a really powerful insight into the mind of a dictator. And how he thinks about people. How, how he thinks about people. And there you, you can see that kind of mindset, not just in the case of dictators, but in case of people who have any level of absolute power. Any level. There could be, for example, somebody sitting in Pakistan, or Dubai, or Qatar, or you know, Jordan, somewhere, very wealthy, and he has servants. Right? And when he has that kind of control, how does he treat the servants? How does she treat the servants? You know, I mentioned to you the story before, I don't get tired of it because I'm startled by it and I'm disturbed by it. There was a friend of mine who went to Pakistan not too long ago and they took him to this restaurant that's famous for chai. And they make, they make chai. So this, the, he's there and there's this other car that pulls up, like a high-end car, SUV, and the, the tinted window rolls down and there's this 10-year-old kid who orders chai. And the way he talks to the 70-year-old old gentleman who's serving the chai, Hey! Did you get that's how he talks to him. And he's like, yes sir, yes sir. And he goes and runs and gets the tea. And he says, it's cold. And he spills it like that. And give me another one. That's Fir'aun, the mini Fir'aun right there. You know? You don't need to have a pyramid. You don't need to be in ancient Egypt. That's, that's, that's Fir'aun in the making. You know? And so when he declared, when he has this thinking less of people, Thinking like people are insignificant. By the way, you can have Fir'aun inside your family. Many Fir'auns. People thinking of their daughter-in-laws. Sometimes people thinking of their parents like they're nothing. Like they're a burden. Treating them like garbage. You know? Every time the father speaks, can you not? Can you just leave me alone? The mother's crying, go cry, go cry somewhere else. You know? Treating, treating family, anybody you, that is in a position of weakness, parents become old, they're weaker. 
to treat them like trash, you know. Or if a family is powerful and a new, the daughter has been brought into the, the household. Or the adopted child. Or the orphan in the family that's being treated like garbage. Then you are Fir'aun to them. Then you treat them like that. You talk to them like that. This is, this is why we have to study these ayat carefully. This is not just about some great leader. But you could be Fir'aun inside a two-bedroom apartment. That, that when we study these ayat, we should reflect on ourselves. May Allah keep us from, from being people of pride against others. فَحَشَرَ فَنَادَى So he gathered and he made a call. فَقَالَ أَنَا رَبُّكُمُ الْأَعْلَى Then he declared, I am your master, all of you. The most supreme. The highest master you could possibly have. وَفِي لَفْضِ الْأَعْلَى هُنَا مَلْحَظْ دَقِيقٍ فَلَيْسَ الْقَصْدُ مِنْهُ مَعْنَى الْمُفَاضَلَةِ وَإِنَّمَا هُوَ الْإِطْلَاقِ غَيْرَ الْمَحْدُودِ بِمَفْضُولِ The word Al-A'la doesn't mean I am your superior master. It means I am your most supreme master. It's the superlative form. As if to say you can't possibly think of a God higher than myself. There is no room for anybody else. Who are you going to go talk to? Who are you going to speak with? This is describing again the attitude of his godhood. But understand that the word Rabb, the word Rabb isn't necessarily shirk. The word Ilah is. مَا عَلِمْتُ لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَٰهٍ غَيْرِ He says other places in the Qur'an, I don't know of any ilah for you besides myself, any God for you besides myself. The word Rabb doesn't necessarily have to mean God. The word Rabb could actually mean master. It could mean master. And in that sense, he's saying, I am your most supreme authority. Nobody needs to be obeyed other than myself. And if you understand that, then it's not just a criticism of someone who claimed to be God. It's beyond that. It's someone who claimed superiority over people under him by declaring, by she or he declaring that there's no higher authority than they are. And people will do that in life. People will declare their, impose their authority on others and be oppressive to others by declaring that authority. فَقَالَ أَنَا رَبُّكُمُ الْأَعْلَى Allah says, فَأَخَذَهُ اللَّهُ نَكَالَ الْآخِرَةِ وَالْأُولَى so Allah, therefore, Allah made an example out of him. I wanted to highlight the fa al fa as sababiyah first. Fa, therefore, akhadahu Allahu nakal al akhira wal ula. Allah made an example out of him. Allah turned him into a nakal, which I'll explain in a second, for the final, for the very end, and the earliest, and we'll explain that too. But the first thing is when people ask, act arrogantly in this world, then Allah makes it a point to turn, the, make an example out of them. And by the way, that's, that's ironic because the Pharaoh, when the magicians disobeyed him, he wanted to make an example out of them. No, you know, when he was going to cut their arms and legs from opposite sides and hang them. I will crucify all of you in public and mutilate your bodies and let them hang there to make an example of those who defy me. And Allah says, I will make an example out of him for any who defy me. It's actually flipping the script on the Pharaoh. فَأَخَذَهُ اللَّهُ نَكَالَ الْآخِرَةِ وَالْأُولَى وَأَصْلُ النَّكِلْ قَيْدُ الدَّابَّةِ وَحَدِيدُهُ الْلَّجَامِ وَنَكَّلَهُ قَيَّدَهُ Chains on an animal or the, the cage for an animal is actually نَكَل in Arabic. An animal that's being tortured because it was out of line like a dog that bit its owner is now put inside a cage and left out in the sun to teach it a lesson and to also let the other dogs know you do that, you, you get the cage. You know, you have in prisons, when, a, when an inmate goes out of hand, then they have a special cell, a more torturous place, just for that prisoner. That's a nakal, actually. أَخَذَهُ اللَّهُ نَكَالَ الْآخِرَةِ نَكَّلَهُ قَيَّدَهُ فَهُوَ الْقَيْدُ وَالْغِلِ Chain also, the chain and a fetter. Allah Azza wa Jal wanted to show him humiliated. By the way, this, this is a powerful word for the Pharaoh because he imprisoned people. He made examples out of people. He chained people and enslaved people. You know? And, and uh, humiliated and tortured those who stood against him to terrify others. And Allah says, I will do that to you to terrify others who rebel against Allah. The criminals against Allah. فَكَمَا قَالْ إِنَّ لَذَيْنَا أَنْكَالًا وَجَحِيمًا وَاللَّهُ أَشَدُّ بَأْسًا وَأَشَدُّ تَنْكِيلًا So many places in Qur'an, Allah uses the word nakal in the same way. To make an example out of somebody, to terrify them. Now, what, is, what does it mean? فَأَخَذَهُ اللَّهُ nakal al الْآخِرَةِ وَالْأُولَى That last part. The, the afterlife and the earlier. Means some say, فَالنَّكَالُ الْإِغْرَاقِ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْإِحْرَاقِ فِي الْآخِرَةِ 
that it's actually the, burn, the way he's going to burn in the afterlife and the way he's going to be drowned in this life. Allah tortures him with water in this life and tortures him with fire in the next, right? But the order is flipped. It's nakal al-akhirah wal-ula. Like the, he made an example for what happens to people in hell first and then what happens to people in this life. This is important to note. When people act this way, Allah will not just punish in hell. Allah will punish fil ula too. In other words, with dunya kadalik. Allah will punish in this world too. People better watch out. They're thinking, oh Allah will, judgment day will come, then punishment will come. No, 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 no. Allah will deal with you in this life also. In this life also. And then in, in the next life. Of course, compared to this life and the next life, the, the torture of the next life is way worse. So he put that first. Al-Akhirah. And then he said, by the way, not just the afterlife, also in this life. There may be those who have to pay their price in this life. وَقُدِّمَتِ الْآخِرَةُ عَلَى الْأُولَى لِأَنَّ نَكَا لَهَا أَفْضَحْ وَأَبْقَى That the Akhirah was mentioned first before the, this life because its punishment is far more intense and longer lasting. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَا عِبْرَةً لِمَنْ يَخْشَى Is Maghrib in, by the way? Have time? 15. Oh, beautiful. Okay. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَا عِبْرَةً لِمَنْ يَخْشَى In all of that, there is a powerful lesson for though, for anybody who will, who will choose to be afraid. لِمَنْ يَخْشَى Now the word يَخْشَى is coming for the second time. Notice these words are not accidental. When words recur in a surah, they're building off of when they came before. So before we saw, وَأَهْدِيَكَ إِلَى رَبِّكَ فَتَخْشَى And now, إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَا عِبْرَةً لِمَنْ يَخْشَى So it's picking up from where it left off. There, Musa was speaking to Fir'aun, telling him, I'm offering you to, to guide you to your master, then perhaps you'll also develop fear and consciousness of Allah. At the end of that whole story, Allah says, by the way, the point of all of it was, this will all serve some lesson for any among you that choose to be afraid, to choose to humble themselves also. لِمَنْ yaksha. In other words, that same offer that was made to the Pharaoh is now being made to you. This is to show you and me that it's not just talking about the Pharaoh. It's talking about you and me. It's not, it's something relevant, relevant to yourself and myself. And so he brings the point back and using the same word. رُبَّمَا كَانَ إِسْتِعْمَالُهُ الْلُغَوِيَ الْأَوَّلِ The word ibra, which I translated here as lesson. Um, you know, Bint al is now going to describe what it meant originally. فِي تَعْبِيرِ الدَّرَاهِمْ أَيْ وَزْنِهَا لِمَعْرِفَةِ قِيمَتِهَا uh, the first meaning of ibra is actually to evaluate the coins by weighing them. You know, back in the day, currency was weighed, right? So, because, you know, silver, bronze, whatever it is, it's weighed, and that's how you know its value. And so, she says to evaluate currency, to evaluate jewelry and metal, etc., that's actually from the, the original meaning of the word ibr. أو من عبر الوادي إذا قطعه من عبره إلى عبره which means to cross over a valley. So there are two basic meanings in the word ibr. One is to find value, to discover value. And the other is to cross over. And they actually say in the Arabic language, abara for even like tajawuz al ma, like you know, or jawuz al ma, when you cross the river, it's also ubur, you crossed over it. Ibra, uh, that's why even in poetry, if somebody cries, this is also ubur. Because the, the tear crossed over from your eye, down your skin, it passed over. Right? And from it you get the notion that Ibra is a lesson so powerful that moves you to tears. It also, it's also a lesson in which you find great value. It's also a lesson that helps you cross from where you are to where you need to be. These are implications of the word Ibra, when Allah uses the word Ibra. In other words, not just a lesson, a lesson that should move you, a lesson that should emotionally move you and practically move you. It should change something in you. And a lesson that you should find truly valuable. وَقِيلَ عَبَرَ الْكِتَابِ إِذَا تَدَبَّرَهُ وَلَمْ يَرْفَعْ صَوْتَهُ بِقِرَاءَتِهِ عِبْرُ الْكِتَابِ is also used when somebody contemplates something deeply. So عِبْرَ is something to contemplate and think about for yourself. Now, uh, now uh, the, the, the thing that I wanted to highlight before I went on is how she comments on the word عِبْرَ and its use in the story. وَاسْتِعْمَالُ الْعِبْرَ فِي الْاعْتِبَارِ مَلْحُوظٌ فِيهِ أَنَّ الْمَرْءِ يَرَى مَثَلًا أَمَامَهُ فَيَزِنُهُ وَيَخْبِرُهُ وَيَتَدَبَّرُهُ وَيَتَّعِذُ بِهِ 
A person is considered to take ibra when he, see, when he or she hears an example, they evaluate the example, they compare it to their own experience, they contemplate it, and they take counsel from that example. And the example here is that of the Pharaoh, الذي طغى, the one who rebelled. So you and I think about ourselves and how we've rebelled. On this note, I want to share with you a, a universal because the passage is also moved on. Uh, I'll share a, 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 a very valuable universal in your own journey through the Quran as you're reading Quran. So the Qur'an has very extreme cases. It's important to note that. Extreme, Qur'an has very extreme cases. Qur'an talks about really amazing people. Not normal people like you and me, really amazing people. And then when Qur'an talks about bad people, it talks about really bad people. And that can present a problem. Because you're neither really good, like really, really good, nor are you what? Really, really bad. So how are you supposed to relate to the Qur'an? Because on the one hand, somebody could say, well, this, these crimes and this punishment that's being talked about in the Qur'an is about some truly messed up people. I'm not that bad. I mean, I'm bad, but I'm no Fir'aun. I mean, don't ask my wife, but you know, don't. <laughs> I'm not that bad. On the other hand, somebody could say, well, you know, the good things Allah wants us to do and the good things that people did in the past, those were some pretty amazing people. You can't expect me to do what they did. They're just way up there, I'm just a regular person. So what happens then is our ability to relate with the Qur'an or relate with the examples with the Qur'an gets severely diminished. And the Qur'an's value as something that should be contemplated as relevant to ourselves goes away. right? Because we can't connect with it because it's just too extreme of an example. It's probably because we're looking at it the wrong way. The extreme examples are given for a reason. They're given for a reason. Allah will mention, for example, just to give you some idea. Musa alayhi salam, one of the greatest people that ever lived. As a matter of fact, even as a young man, Allah says, أَتَيْنَاهُ حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا Allah had given him wisdom and knowledge. How many young people have wisdom? And Allah mentions he's a young man, he had wisdom. And after Allah describes Musa alayhi salam had wisdom, in the very next ayah, he killed somebody by accident. He had wisdom, he had knowledge, and next thing you know, he committed an accidental murder. Involuntary manslaughter. You could argue even, like that's a hard case to make because he threw a punch. It's not like he accidentally bumped into someone and they fell off a cliff. He punched somebody and they died. So that, that, that's pretty serious. How is it then that Allah says he has wisdom and he did that? Because that's not very, very wise. What Allah is teaching us is, wisdom doesn't make you perfect. Knowledge doesn't make you perfect. Wisdom and knowledge, no matter how great you are, you could be as great as who? Musa alayhi salam. You could still make a mistake. So what Allah does, even when He gives the greatest of examples, is He actually illustrates that even they can have this problem. Like for example, Allah will talk about, uh, Allah will talk about Yaqub alayhi salam, one of the greatest prophets. So noble and so beautifully described in the Qur'an. And he has problems raising his kids. His kids don't listen to him. His kids even make fun of him. His kids even yell at him. His kids lie to him. And his kids hate their siblings. They do all of this stuff. Now you're like, I, my kids don't listen to me. I must be a bad mother. I must be a bad father. I must not have done my job as a parent. Hold on a second. There are people that were much better than you. Like who? Yaqub alayhi salam. Who had trouble with their kids? It's okay. If they, if they had that, you're not a bad person. Relax. Allah gives those extreme examples so that you find hope in it. Not so you distance yourself from them, but you say, if they can have it, why can't I? If they can have those issues, why can't I? Why is somebody having trouble in their marriage? Well, Nuh salam had trouble in his marriage. Why do we have arguments between husband and wife that brings us to the brink of divorce? Why did that even happen to the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the Qur'an? That happened, because it'll happen. That has nothing to do with you being a good person or a bad person. People will tell you, you should have sabr. Don't cry because your child passed away or because your child is you know, sick. Don't cry, you should have sabr. Astaghfirullah, why are you crying? Why is Yaqub crying so much that he becomes blind? Nobody came, Allah didn't come and tell him you shouldn't be crying. As a matter of fact, he's the Prophet who said, فَصَبْرٌ Jamil. He's the, he's the prophet of sabr and he cried. Which means crying has nothing to do with not having sabr. Don't, don't mess with people who are crying and say you shouldn't be crying. 
because it's not it's wrong you should have sabr that's wrong you don't know quran that's your problem you should instead of instead of spending your time telling people to have sabr you should have some time studying quran yourself that's what you should be doing the examples of prophets are there because they are in fact relatable it's a disservice to say they were much better people so whatever we learn about them has nothing to do with us it's it's the wrong way of thinking about it the same way with bad people Bad people, you're like, oh, well, I'm no pharaoh. I didn't kill no babies, so I'm good. Next page. <laughs> you know, I didn't try to kill no prophet. If I saw a staff turn into a snake, I'd be good. I'd fall into sajda with the, with the magicians. You know. But actually, what Fir'aun, what, what, these are what you can call archetypes. Their behavior. You may not be Fir'aun, but there may be something in your life that re resembles what Fir'aun did. You're not entirely Fir'aun, but something in your life is kind of a little too close to Fir'aun's attitude. You understand? And you have to contemplate, think, be afraid. Am I resembling in Fir'aun in any way possible? When truth is brought to me, when sincere advice is given to me, and I make fun of it, well, it seems to be a parallel because true advice was given to the Pharaoh and he made fun of it. Maybe I'm a, bit, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a bit too close to the great empire of the past when it comes to that. It could be. The same thing I'll tell you with hypocrites. Munafiqoon of Qur'an will never come again. The hypocrites talked about in the Qur'an will never happen again. Those are people who schemed against the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Even tried to kill him They made fun of the Qur'an as it was being revealed They conspired, they abandoned the battlefield Will that ever happen again? No Not at that level Nobody can ever say you're a munafiq like Abdullah ibn Ubay No, Abdullah ibn Ubay gets a special prize For what he accomplished with his hypocrisy in the seal of the Prophet Sallallahu Because the greatest crimes committed can, be, can only be the crimes committed against the Messenger in the flesh, in front of them. But is it possible that we might share some qualities with those hypocrites? Some elements of their hypocrisy have made their way into us? Yeah, that's, that's, that's certainly capable. That's certainly possible. So it's wrong for you to say to somebody, you're just like Fir'aun, and you remind me of this, or you remind... No, 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 no. This is about ourselves. Introspection, looking at ourselves. But at the same time, don't superimpose one on top of the other. It's glimpses, it's, it's bits and pieces that we have to extract from each of these examples and see what of them applies to us and how they apply to us. That's what contemplation is. That's actually what tadabbur is. Tadabbur is to see what of this applies to me. How does it apply to me? That means you have to have a very good eye on the text and you have to have a really good eye on what you're up to. Man arafa nafsahu arafa rabbahu. Whoever knows himself well, knows their master well. You know? This is, this is truly knowing oneself, acknowledging in oneself what qualities they may have. And so, now we're, it's going to move to the next passage, but before we go there, I'll give you guys a break because the next passage is an entirely different subject. There's a few other really interesting things about the literary qualities of the surah that I'll share with you at the end, but for now I'll give you guys a break. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa